very much. Thank you, Mark, and thanks for coming, all of you. And thank you especially, God, for your energy for being here. Thank you, Mark. I want to ask you right off how you became a filmmaker. Okay. Let me, before I answer that, may I say something? Whatever I'm going to say tonight, let me give you a um, disclaimer. It's likely to tell you myself and the subject. Now, that's not just unique for me. That's probably true for all of us. I just want you to know that there's a real, what I'm saying is it'll show you the limits of what I know rather than what the subject is. Now, going to myself, uh, I was a Christian brother for a long time. During that time, uh, for almost 11 years, I worked with street gangs. And during that period, as a brother, we were to be in the world, but not of it. Um, I'm sure you know what that means. And if you don't, look it up. Uh, and so I was not a worldly person. I didn't see cinema. I, I didn't, maybe I saw The Life of Christ or Monsieur Vincent or something like that. But during the course of working with street gangs, another brother, Brother Alexis Gonzalez, uh, said, Godfrey, I'm going to show you a film that will change your life. He says, you'll have to give permission to see it. We had to have permission to see films. And he brought to me the most extraordinary film I had ever seen, and still to this day, by Luis Bunuel, called Los Olvidados, which means the forgotten ones or the young in the dam. And uh, that was shot in the barrios of Mexico City in the late 40s. And while Mexico City is a much bigger place, it had in its barrio atmosphere the same atmosphere of the mud houses that I was working in, adobe houses on the streets without pavement uh, in the barrios of northern New Mexico. So in seeing this film, it was not entertaining. It was not informational. It was, for me, a deep spiritual experience. It touched me, and it touched the young women and men that I was working with. And it became like our church. So it moved me so much, I got permission to buy a 16 millimeter copy of it. And I had a projector, because I was a teacher as well. And I would show that on the walls of the barrio frequently, because it was something that constantly inspired myself, as well as the young people I was working with. So, of course, this was in the early 60s that I saw this film. I didn't begin making media until 1974. I began Koyanis Katsi in 1975. But that event was a watermark event for me. It tattooed me, as it were. Now, Luis Bunuel is one of the great masters of all time, as far as I'm concerned, of cinema. And, of course, I can't do what he did, nor was that my proclivity. That's, that's what he did. But I felt, what I did feel is that if cinema can have that effect on myself and these young people, then why not consider that as a vehicle to give voice to those things that I was feeling? And that's how I got into cinema. Uh, the first, the first uh, event of cinema, or media, I should say, was done in 1973 and in 74 with the campaign for the American Civil Liberties Union. Everything that Snowden is talking about right now in terms of privacy, surveillance, uh, the uh, surveillance state was already well in place and hidden in plain sight, certainly in the 1970s when I was around. It's at that time that the Church Commission was also talking about the effect of surveillance on privacy and on individual rights. The campaign we did was called 10 More Years and Counting. And what it was was a saturation mixed media campaign. And at that time, uh, if you did something through television or through other mediums, there was an FCC requirement that they allow you to do what's called public interest advertising. But that had no presence. When this was going on, the signal for TV turned off at 11 or 12 at night with the prayer by St. Francis or, you know, some patriotic uh, madness. So it was a very different world of media. But I realized with my colleagues that that would give us no presence. So 
my angel, person willing to make a bad deal for love of the project, put up enough money for this campaign that we would be able to play at the same level as the banks, as the cigarette companies at that time that advertised, and the liquor companies. So we were literally omnipresent in the, uh, it was based out of Albuquerque, but it went into Colorado, went into Utah, went into Arizona, and of course all over New Mexico. And uh, we had billboards at high traffic density areas, we had television at prime time, we had radio at drive time, we had talking heads, uh, the main political person that we invited deliberately because he was a conservative and a Republican, though we weren't, the group, was Barry Goldwater Jr., who was one of the very first people that alerted the country to the effects of, of what surveillance was doing to our civil liberties. So he made it very apt and unexpected uh, crusader, as it were, for this issue. What we were able to do during the course of a year is completely take public opinion and take it from 14% up to 68%. Now, we did this at a time when the political conventions were going on, knowing that politicians do the right thing for the wrong reason, that they live by polls in their hip pocket. We conducted polls from the University of New Mexico, Dr. Gerald Haber, he was a statistician, a mathematician, and it showed the effect of this campaign on the public because the public could not avoid seeing it. And it's at that event that the concept of a non-spoken narrative became structured or clear. So all of the TV spots had no, no speaking except the last one that told people how to get in touch with the ACLU, but all the rest of them were image and music. And they were so impactful that for the first time in the history of at least those broadcasters, people were calling in constantly to find out when the next ad would be on, which is rather remarkable. The other thing is billboards at high traffic density areas. Um, what do I mean by that? When you look, while all billboards might appear different, if you start analyzing them for their patterns, not what they're saying, but their patterns, most commodity billboards have the same kind of patterning to them. They're trying to sell you something. So we deliberately tried to put our billboards in these, again, high traffic density areas, but only where there were other boards because we stuck out like having two thumbs on your hand instead of one. You would notice it right away. And in fact, we had people sitting behind the billboards to watch. Before our billboards went up, instead of people, while people notice the billboards, they're not giving it conscious attention, but the billboard's looking at them. When this billboard, when these billboards came up, they were produced conscious attention, which we wanted because they were in diametric uh, design opposition, as I said, to the nature of commodity advertising. Now, why do I bring all that up? It was right after that that Koyanis Katsi started coming off of that event, and um, we tried to take this uh, project nationally. Uh, we had the University of Chicago signed up. I was working at that point out of the ACLU in New York. I had an office there, the national office, a person maybe you know, R.E.A. Nyer was the director at that time, very important person, and he wanted to do it nationally. So we were going to invite people from the Watergate Committee, which was happening around that time, uh, this, the uh, Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights, and a lot of very important congressmen, we were going to have them, and they were already signing up to come because the ACLU was paying for it and inviting them to come to this beautiful conference center in Chicago. And without them knowing it, we were gonna survey the holy hell out of these people so that they would have the experience rather than the abstraction of what it was to be under surveillance. Well, R.E.A. Nair got fired for a reason having nothing to do with us, and all the projects that he brought in were canceled. So that directed me with my crew to go into Koyaniskazi. Oh, 
Oh, so the door closed. You couldn't do what you were planning to do. Right. And koyaniskatsi is what came of that. Right, an unintended consequence. There you go. For those of us who are watching films in movie theaters in the 1980s, Koyaniskatsi was just a, a, a mind-blowing <laughs> revelation. Uh, we hadn't seen anything like it. I remember in the early 80s, my wife and I going to a multiplex to see this film everybody was talking about, which had no words, which had no text really particularly, um, was a mesmerizing combination of image and sound, and it was just the, the hit lines at the box office. And so this was just shocking. And of course, w those of us who follow film have followed Godfrey's career in the years since. But all these years later, it's very exciting to be able to ask you to talk through the early stages of Koyaniskatsi and how it came to be. I mean, for instance, uh, did you have something on paper, an outline, a plan before you went to various locations? Oh, or yeah, yeah. What yeah. was the what There was, was the a process? method. We weren't, I don't believe in shooting from the hip. What I do believe in is spontaneity, however, but the way to take advantage of spontaneity is to be as organized as possible. So, yes, I'm an organizer by uh, instinct, let's say. Parenthetically, I worked for a good while with Saul Alinsky, that devil that they accused Obama of being involved with who never even met the dude. He was just in a program that used the Alinsky name. But having said that, uh, I made an enormous amount of preparation and I realized, and I'll use a term that I'm sure you know, the genius loci. The locations themselves were going to be the actors. I wanted to film them, and you'll have to forgive, I'll date myself, as if they were Rita Hayworth or Marilyn Monroe. I wanted to bring as much effort to filming the, the location, the subject matter, which was not humans, but the artifice that we've built called the technological world. And so I wanted to give that a voice. So my job was to go around the country several times by myself and choose the locations. Now, having said that, I always work with people more talented than myself. What does that mean? I don't use a computer. It's, I could give you a lot of reasons why, but it's not what you think. I'm an addicted kind of person, and I felt if I ever got into it, I might never get out of it. And I think that might be the case for nine out of eight of us, okay? It, it's something that becomes addictive. So I wanted to stay away from that. I had plenty of other things. And in fact, I don't know if you know this, but the, the uh, predecessor to the uh, internet, uh, France had a predecessor. And it was put out by telecommunications company. Everybody got a computer so you could book your train your, your, your plane, you could buy tickets for entertainment, sports. It was all for that in a very nascent form. And none of that interested me, to be truthful. So I took a big buy. Now, um, working with uh, people like Ron Fricke, who I think is a cinematic genius, who not only can shoot the camera, but can build them and design them, um, I then bring these people out to the location talk to them, to their, to their annoyed probably, try to marinate them in what it is I'm seeing, and by dent of repetition, it gets in. But I'm not going to tell Ron Fricke how to do what he knows how to do much better than I. So of course, when I say I, I mean we. These are collaborative efforts that cannot be done at least the kind of films I do by one person. Now, if you were Stan Brackage, who's another cinematic genius for sure, well, he's working on frame by frame, even sandwiching the celluloid, putting things in between. That's a, that's a lone ranger operation, okay? But this kind of film, music, uh, principal photography, editing, all the other things that go with it, stock footage, it was way beyond my capacity. So the crew had to be focused on what it is I wanted. And at that time, I had read a book by uh, Jacques Ellul, which I'll recommend highly, called The Technological Society, done in the mid-20th century. 
It's probably the most erudite book I've ever read on technology. Uh, he's written maybe 50 books. Uh, he was so insightful that he was both an enemy of the right and the left in, in France, which was made big impression on me because he was not part of a structure. He had his own original idea. And everything that he was saying was giving voice to what I felt. And what he was saying is the following. I'll, I'll paraphrase it now. He was saying that technology is the most misunderstood subject ever. He said it, it was the most profound event of the last 5,000 years, and it's gone completely unnoticed. Now, I'll put in, I'll try to give you my point of view on it. We, we label ourselves under the idea that technology is something we use, that we're in the driver's seat. It can be used for nil, it can be used for good or for bad. That to me is a very naive, though an academic point of view, okay? Technology, like all tools, have built into them a politic or a direction or a determination. So technology for me is not something we use, it is the environment. It is as ubiquitous as the air we breathe. So if, if in other words, what I'm trying to say is that we no longer live with nature. We live in a technological universe. We are the aliens on the planet. If you lived in the Middle Ages, uh, you would, um, um, how would I say it? Um, if you lived in the Middle Ages and were in, in, in Europe, you were heavily affected by Catholicism. So it's, re it's constantly cited how people were seeing angels all the time. Like we see what? Aliens all the time, alien abduction. I don't want to question if you've been abducted by an alien, but I say that we are the alien in the room and we are projecting ourselves. We are, and because we live in a technological world. So the focus of Koyaniskatsi is the technological universe we live in. And so how I, I decided, well, you know, there's no point in talking about it because in my limited point of view, our language no longer describes the world in which we live. And I know that we see the world not so much through our eyes as through the language we speak. That's why a person like Wittgenstein can say, the limit of my language is the limit of my world. And what we do know is that what we know is so small compared to the vivid unknown that we live in that it becomes ridiculous to narrate something with the apparency of fullness. It eliminates all the complexity of the world in which we live in. So I decided, well, I wanted to have a narrative, but I wanted it to be a speechless narrative. And I wanted it to be a narrative that was autodidactic rather than didactic. And so what do I mean by that? If you go to an art gallery, um, if everyone saw the same picture in the same way, then that wouldn't be art, it would be social realism, propaganda, which is propaganda, or advertising, where the mistake is, un where the, not mistake, but the point of view is unmistakable. I wanted to make something that was conceived in ambiguity where it is, as you know, it is the, we all see a different picture. And I wanted to present a picture that gave up the specificity of clarity in order to bring you the profundity, if I can be so bold, of an experience. So that's kind of the, this is the focus not only of Koyanis Katsi, it's the focus of the Katsi trilogy, of the other films that I've done uh, that I and my colleagues have done. It's been like many turns around the same tree of technology. In that sense, I consider myself a hedgehog, rather focused on what I'm doing and certainly not a fox with, you know, a polymath group of grasp of everything around me. Mm -hmm. Now you said you started on Koyanis Gatsi in 75. 75. We saw it in theaters in 83. Uh, it's quite a journey from over those years. Um, 
But I wonder what it was like when it achieved this amazing success. You must have been surprised. Okay, now that's a very good story. The only person that wasn't surprised because I'm a little mentally ill was myself. <laughs> okay? I had great expectations for this film and I knew that for it to see the light of day I had to use the highest level of technique. And please, this got me in a lot of trouble with people that were giving me money for the film because they said, well, you're saying this is a critique of techno criticism of technology, yet you're using some of the, the most advanced technique available on the market. And I felt, well, I mean, isn't this what we're capable of doing, holding contradictions and acting upon them? Um, so. I, lived in, I live in the Southwest, where one fights a fire, a forest fire, with another fire. So I didn't pay attention to that. But what I'm saying is that lost me a lot of, um, of effort. But what was your question? Well, I just thought the success. Oh yeah, the success of the film. Yeah. Um, so when the film was finished, let me back up now. The choice of Philip Glass as the uh, composer for the film was the most controversial decision I made because not a person that worked on the film in the beginning liked Philip Glass. For him, for them, he was the master of the broken needle. They didn't understand what he was doing. They thought it was just repetition, mindless repetition. It's anything but that. I was in a religious community where we sang Gregorian chant every day. I felt the power of chant. And Philip's music, rather than being based in the 12-tone Western scale, is based more in Vedic Hindu chant. It has that aspect to it. So it, it's following another rhythm completely. It's transcendental. It brings you to another space. And cinematically, because there's always a foreground and a background happening, it's, it's a luscious piece of music to cut image, to cut visuals with. Now, the, nobody liked Philip Glass, but I insisted on having him, and I think it was the best decision I've ever made. Uh, I felt that, when, and when the film was finished, the crew felt that, you know, thank goodness, um, and maybe it'll be seen in a museum. And I had a screening in Santa Fe because it had taken me seven years to make the film, and all my friends knew that I had really gone off the deep end felt bad for me actually, so I, at the Lenzig Theater, which is very similar to the Paramount Theater here, one of those old showboats, I rented the theater, and it's an 860 uh, piece the uh, seat theater. There were about 2,000 people that showed up, okay, mainly because I had lived in Santa Fe so long, probably. But that night, when it was seen, the, when, after the first screening, the crowd erupted, and we could all tell that maybe we had something in the kitty that we didn't realize. And then, I was, when I was mixing the film with the crew at the Goldwyn Studios in Hollywood, uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so we mixed it from 11 at night to 8 in the morning. They'd give us an extra hour on an eight-hour day for taking the graveyard shift. Coppola was around at that studio at that time. He came in one night about two in the morning, ducked his head in and said, ooh, I'd love to see that film. And um, so we said, of course, we'll show it to Francis. He's like Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and, uh, and Donald Trump all wrapped into one person, okay? <laughs> and uh, so, of course, we showed it to Francis. He says, I love it, when he finished. He says, he stood up, Philip and I were there, and a couple of other people, and he said, what can I do? Can I offer you my name to present this? Which I immediately said yes, because with Francis Coppola's name on the front of the film, everyone thought it was a Francis Coppola film. People do the right thing for the wrong reason, and they showed up to see a Francis Coppola film. Now, the film was coming out at the time of the 25th anniversary or the 20th, I can't remember, of the New York Film Festival. It was 1983, and uh, 1982 when that happened. And um, nobody at the festival except Tom Luddy and another woman whose name I'm having trouble remember, there were a board of seven or eight people on the committee, nobody, they hated the film. They thought it was hippie dribble, quote unquote, 
And uh, Tom Luddy loved the film. He was Francis Coppola's uh, creative director and the former director of the uh, Pacific Film Archives at Berkeley. And a real, he's been my producer, one of the producers on all the films. So Francis had a uh, colleague named Bernie Gersten that just became the director of Radio City Music Hall. And Tom, knowing no uh, limits, said, we'll get Radio City Music Hall for this film. And the festival said, well, you're out of your mind. That holds 5,000 people. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a, it'll be a disaster. And Tom said, I'm getting it for nothing. Don't worry, Bernie's my big buddy. And all the money will come to you. The show was to start at 8 o'clock at night. At 7.25 in the evening, two people arrived, the mother and sister of one of my colleagues who lived up in Portsmouth, okay? I said, oh God, this is it, it's all over with. <laughs> By eight o'clock, there were 5,000 people in the theater and another 1,000 outside trying to get in. So, and Tom said, just a roll of the dice, Godfrey. If it works, it's gonna be great, and if it doesn't, bye-bye. It's all over with seven years down to two. So it went over pretty good, let's say great. And that launched the film. Wow. I'd like to show a few minutes of Koyana Scotsi. Please. So I'm going to get on the computer here.
is show some of your work and ask students about the connections between one image and the next. Oh. It leads to a very nice discussion because they're forced to examine reasons other than narrative situations with actors and dialogue, etc. Um, or even in the documentary tradition with the voiceover narrators right. telling us, y there's, there isn't that to fall back on at all and the images have to relate to each other in different ways. So I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall watching you sit down with your editor and work out the image sequencing, the length of each shot, why we see this and then we see this. Could you talk a little bit about how that goes in your filmmaking life? Well, first of all, there's a dramaturgical structure. That's my job to do, to present a form. That's, a, we're talking about an image film, and I want to remind you that the image is constructed of two elements, the visual and the aural. It's not like we do an image and then slap music on it. Each one is like a hand-in-glove operation. One motivates the other, so you have to see them all together all at once. And so, after making that dramaturgical shaping, that's after shooting the film again. We had a, a one for shooting the film, and then after it's shot, you start to hear the music. Let me give you a Polish proverb to try to explain what I'm talking about. There's a proverb that says, begin, and the work will show you how. And that might sound like ooga to you, but it's very real. In, we, we, we had a beautiful lunch today with your faculty brothers and um, uh, I was trying to say that I was comparing it to people who are who have a musical ear so the opposite of a person that has a musical ear is someone that's tone deaf because music is about tones okay in film it's about the visual the image the and those two things together some editors are visually tone deaf, to use that word. You, wanna, you want to work with someone who has a facility for being able to hear the image speak. Now that might sound paradoxical, but that's what actually happens. You can hear the image and you can feel the music at the same time. And uh, it's that that allows us, in other words, a shot can exist only absolutely as long as it tells you that it needs to be on the, uh, on the, on the screen. Let me give you something easier to relate that to. If you're in a band, you know what timing is about. You know when you're off right away. If some guy, if every time you're doing this and he's in another rhythm structure, then the whole thing is not going to come together. So it's not it's not as difficult as it might sound. You just have to be sensitive to that. So what I've done in order to be further to your question, uh, besides the dramaturgical shaping, which means the movements of the film, the ethos that I wish to evoke, the emotional states, all of this is not experimental cinema. I hate that word. This is experiential cinema. We're not experimenting, that's for science, okay? We don't go and experiment, we're trying to feel what's already present and it gives us the information. So, in order to get to that point, after the shooting is done, I develop what's called the vocabulary of visuals. It's like, if, it's like the syntax of a sentence, because the film is not based in text, it's based in texture rather than text because it's not coming from literature, it's coming from something um, more akin to what I would call cinematic poetry, if I can be so bold. It doesn't go along a linear or a, um, a logical path. You're not trying to entertain, you're not trying to tell a story, you're presenting a story to behold. And since everyone beholds a different story, it then that means the person sitting next to you could have a vastly different experience. This is what I'm hoping for in the kinds of films that we do. So this vocabulary of image allows us, I learned right off from the beginning, 
that if we did a montage for 90 minutes or 87 minutes or 100 minutes, it would make you, it would drive you out of the theater. I don't think it can sustain itself that long. So I wanted to have a syntax for the eye rather than for the, for the, uh, rather than for the meaning of something, a syntax of something meaningful. I used an example last night to make the distinction. If you're at the sunset with your beloved and you turn to her or him and say, gee, I wonder what the sunset meant tonight. I guess your beloved would look like at you that you had smoked too much or had taken some funny pill. The, the sunset has absolutely no meaning. However, it can be full of meaningfulness. So there's a difference. Meaning responds to the word. Meaningful responds to the poetry of, the vi of, the, of, of, of cinema, as far as I'm concerned. So we're looking to create a syntax based on a vocabulary of visuals. And as this is going on, we don't, uh, the music is going on at the same time, all together, all at once. I asked Philip never to write note one until he's been completely marinated in the visualization of the film and everything that I'm talking to him about or writing poetry. I drive him crazy with all the stuff I want to tell him and he's a great listener. And then I tell him, I want you now to forget everything I said and I want you now to really see what you can respond to because I can't write the score. I can only talk about it. I can talk about instruments, how, if I want a chorus, if I want a voice, uh, all those kind of things, but that's up to him. So that's going on while the edit is going on together at the same time. For those of you in cinema, you'll know that a, that a composer now writes what's called music cues. Uh, very, you won't have a full musical score for a film. It won't be a theatrical film if that were the case. In this case, we have a full theatrical film with a full musical score. There are sound effects in it, but they're buried. So it's a completely different assignment, and the composer ha is absolutely co-equal with the visual side of the film. So those two together have to work. So I have the composer come as often as possible to the locations of shooting, so he gets an original charge. I have him ad nauseum come look at the selects we've made, and uh, he does that gracefully. And then he comes in and he sees the little edits we're doing, and then based on the dramaturgical structure, let's say in Koyanis Katsi, there were 13 discrete pieces of music, if I'm not mistaken, or just about that, I'd have to but let's say 13 for now. We don't begin in one and go consecutively through 13. We begin wherever he wants to feel the inspiration. So we began on number seven in this case. And um, it's that, that that allows this collaborative effort to happen. So all the players, as it were, from the person in the kitchen to the person answering the phone, to the DP, to the composer, to the editor, and these kind of films all have access to the mainframe. My job is not, we don't then take a vote as to what to do because this is not a democratic event. My job is to be everything from a mother to an assassin and to try to, as it were, realize what it is I'm feeling and I have to see it, I have to feel it to make that happen. So consequently, except for one film, I've decided to live in my editing studio for the entire time of the film. So that's enough to drive the crew a little crazy, you would think, but not really, because then the main room in the studio is the kitchen. We have its beautiful, odiferous greetings us every day. Um, we meet together as a group at 10.30 in the morning and we close out whenever we're finished at night. We have happy hour every day. We eat together, we party together, and I tell the crew, say bye-bye to the family, we're gonna take a walk to Mount Annapurna from here. Now, that might sound extreme, but most of the people I work with work in the business where they have a job 
and they don't have access to the mainframe, and they're doing a task. So it becomes quite exciting for all of us. It becomes like an opportunity to live many lives and die many deaths within the course of several years. And this is the beauty, I think, of filmmaking. The, the real payoff is the making of the film. Everything is in that. Um, it's, it's the joy of it, and it's like living like a hummingbird. You're very privileged. You have so much going on at the same time from suffering, lots of suffering, okay? I'm always full of doubt. Gee whiz, is this the right way to do it? Or it's, it's, it's not something that's, you know, completely clear. It's a process that allows you through being clear with your colleagues. When I say it's a collaborative effort, uh, the most difficult form of art is the art of collaboration. Uh, most artists have egos that are gigantic. Mine's the size of maybe this building. Phillips is the size of St. Cloud, uh, the city. And John Kane's got a big, big ego. But if you have vanity of ego, then you can't be in a critical forum. Because then you have to tell the person what they want to hear rather than what you feel. And so it's in that process that we try to really discover the film that's there in front of us. It's like if you're a sculptor. Anybody here a sculptor? Okay, if you're a sculptor, you have to become, as it were, in you have to learn intimately the, the material you're working with because as a sculptor, it's gonna tell you exactly if it's wood or stone. Let's take stone. If you hit it in the wrong way, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. So you have to, it is, it is as it were, the work itself, to repeat the, pro, the proverb, that tells you what to do. You just have to be attentive to it. Your films prove hard to describe by people who are used to describing conventional films and putting blurbs together in lists. Uh, what will we see? Have you been involved in what gets on the jacket of the DVD release, of any of that? No. I'm not in, I don't wish to be involved in that because I don't believe in explanations for openers. Mm -hmm. An explanation limits the possibility of what's there. I'm sure you know this, uh, that in art, only in the form is there meaning. The meaning is in the form. And like most art and most poetry, what you think you're putting into it is way less than what is actually there if it has a life of its own. It's like your child. You might have given birth to your child, and that's beautiful and it has your genetic structure, but that child should have a life of its own. And um, this is what I'm saying about film. It is in that same modality. Um, the name of the Katsi films, each of the words is from Hopi language. Yeah. Um, if I remember right, you placed the definition at the very end of the films? Yeah. Was it a controversial decision in your mind to even put that definition in there at yes, all? Yes, it was, because, um, um, well, first of all, you have to look at my background. I came from a religious community as a political activist, so a contradiction in terms. My, I, I, if I start talking about it, I might weep, but I mean, we live in such a cruel world. You and I live in wonderland here, protected from the immense, undis untellable, indescribable suffering of the world that we live in right now. Um, it's, uh, you know, we are really sheltered from that, and yet we are implicated in it because we are a, contrary to what all the political people are saying, we are, the, we are in the driver's seat right now and have an enormous effect. So I wanted, in case it wasn't clear, I wanted to have the clarity of that word. And let me explain. If you went to a university and studied ethnology, then you would use the subjective category, subjective, whether it's uh, Levi Strauss or anyone else, the subjective categories of academics to analyze indigenous peoples. So that's fair enough. So I said, well, let's take the subjective categories of indigenous people and have them tell us what they think about us. And I found that in doing this film that 
When I talked to the first Kikmungwe, or the, um, um, one of the spiritual leaders in Hopi at Hort Villa, and he told me, he says, you know, Mr. Godfrey, he says, everything you call sane, I call insane. Everything you call normal, I call abnormal. He says, everything that you call right side up, I call upside down. Well, this was like music to my ears. And what I loved about the word is that this is a culture of orality. It's not a written culture. It's, it's not a literate culture. And it's a profound, under, more profound is their language in understanding our world, from my limited point of view, than our language. As I said earlier, we see the world through language, but our language is no longer describing the world we're, we're living in, because our languages come from metaphors of the real world, of nature, and the world we live in now is a technological world that has nothing to do with the feeling of anything organic. It's all synthetic. So I wanted a term that had no cultural baggage. And Koyanis Katsi, when it came out in Italy, <laughs> it was uh, Koyanis and Katsi means cocks and cock and balls, okay? So that was terrific. I didn't know that. That helped launch the film in Italy. It was a big <laughs> joke, okay? And, in, and many people thought it was like Kawasaki, so it must be from uh, Japan. And uh, I like that even better. And your question two times ago, uh, do you like, did you do the writing on the, the blurbs, none of that. Um, the, um, you know, the, when Koyana Skatsi came out, it was in a video then, video modality. They didn't know whether it was a musical or a foreign film or an art film, or a documentary, or a category that they couldn't put it in. So depending on what store you went to, it was in a different category. It, in that sense, is a sine monad. It's beyond the boundaries of, of, con, of, of uh, traditional, not definition, but only traditional cinematic definition. I'm going to put a little bit of Poakatsi in. And am I pronouncing that right? Poakatsi. Poakatsi, your second film in the trilogy. Can, can I mention this, though, Please. before you go to the word, the, the other words? Uh, those words, uh, Koyanis Katsi, uh, I had to work with a German scholar, Eckhart Malatki, who speaks Hopi, rare um, for a white person, and is a scholar. And he had access to a lot of Hopi people that were his students at the University of Arizona in Flagstaff. And so we created uh, a, a definition that was true to the original, as far as we could tell, to the original meaning of that word. And that word itself was not current in the Hopi language at that time, except for a few people. So when that came out, I was called like by the examinating board to get a PhD from your university. They wanted to know, where did you get that word? I was called by a group from another Mesa. Each Mesa is fiercely independent of the other, but they are united through their ritual ceremonies. And I went there with my, you know, the Kikmungwe, David Manange, who was my connection there, and an old woman named Mina Lanza, who was one of the most important people in Olariabi at that time. And uh, they stood up for me, and I think they asked me about four questions. The interview lasted several hours, and most of it was in Hopi with big arguments between the people there, and I would hear a little bit of it, and at the end they said, you're free to use the word. <laughs> so I was, you know, felt fantastic. Now, let's see, Poakatsi then. Um, an entity or a way of life that consumes the life of others to further its own life. Right. So to me, since poet, since Poakatsi is about north-south relations, when I was, um, when, when Koyanis Katsi opened in Europe, it opened at the Berlin Film Festival, and the wall was still up then, and the wall said east-west, but I kept seeing north-south. And then, to my great amazement, a few years later, Willy Brandt wrote this great book, North-South. And it was about the relationship of Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. So to see something as, as, uh, as 
concrete as a wall that's screaming east-west and picking up north-south, that was the inspiration for Powakatsi because I felt that we in the north, we that live in hyperkinetic industrial grids, kind of on speed in rush hour, outrunning our future, consuming the planet as it were, living in a world that's very finite but with an infinite appetite of tool, of technology, that um, Powakatsi, what better word could it be? We are, in fact, predating on cultures of orality, cultures of simplicity, handmade cultures, cultures that have been here beyond before history was written, living in the same manner as when they started. Something most beautiful that maybe all of us are going to have to go back to, those of us that might be around. To me, the, the debacle has already occurred, but that's another subject. So, poakatsi became a most important word because it showed the relationship of Southern Hemisphere to Northern Hemisphere societies. Well, I'll pop a bit in. What I wanted to start with is an image that I found always very hypnotic. A shot on a train to Sao Paulo, apparently, that, that goes for more than a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, no, it's, it's in the state of Pala, oh, okay. which is where the Serra Pallada gold mine is. It's a, it's a big industrial, uh, it's full of resource, so that train was a resource train.
this sequence made me think about our walk downtown in St. Cloud today, where you asked, pointing to our eight-story tall bank building, if that's the tallest building in St. Cloud, and I said, yeah, and you said, good. Right. <laughs> I, I'm, I know that not just in Pawakatsi, but also in your other films, those aerial shots looking down on these tall buildings are very iconic. They, they stick in my mind long after I see them. Could you talk about that a bit? Well, a lot of it has to do with how it's filmed. Uh, there are many ways to film, so I don't want to bore you with all of them, but one way that's not filmed normally is to have the camera... In other words, if you're going that way, I point the camera that way. Mm. And it produces a whole different dynamic of what your eye sees. So we're flying in one direction, but the camera is pointing in the other direction. And that's what gives, I think, the power to that shot. Of course, it's the DP, in this case, Leo Zardumas, um, who, who did the train shot and this shot into Sao Paulo. But uh, this, in this particular film, Poacazzi, uh, the train, uh, this comes right after um, a whole section on people who live handmade ways of life. This is now the introduction into the great maggot, this magnet, the city that's pulling people out by their ancestral roots from the country that they live in because now money, which as you know, earth, wind, water, fire, money, money becomes the fifth element, as it were, and money changes everything, okay? And the city is the emblem of money. And so what you see from this point on is now those same people that you saw in their villages, in the terraces in uh, Nepal or, or in, in Peru or in the Amazon, you now see them being coming into the cities. I, I spent some time in China in 1984, and the majority of people live still in the countryside. Now, since that short time ago, which is like a technologically 500 years ago, um, now most the majority of people are living in the cities. And if this keeps going, most of the people will live in the city because they want to take over the industrialize the countryside. So they've built, the, I mean, the dam in Brazil, Itapu, was the biggest dam in the world. Now, the dam that's built in China, you could put 10 Itapus in. And what they wiped out to achieve that progress is a way of life. And where did those people go? Into the city. So this was like the uh, matrix point of the film. It brought us over into the other world should have started a little sooner to show the people because the people are shot th through, through much of the early part of the film where you see them in their m moving in their bodies but I'm just struck by how far down you have to look below the skyscrapers to that bottom the streets and well you can't really even see people you see the cars it just makes quite a strong and frightening point. Well, you know, if there was an alien that arrived here, they would think that the cars were the event and there were these, these two-legged or four, four appendage things running around servicing cars. I mean, when I lived in, when Koyaniskatsi was done, I lived in Venice, California from 77 to 82. And um, at that time, Southern California had more cars than any other place in the world except the rest of the United States, <laughs> uh, Southern California. So, I mean, it, the exponential explosion of progress and development is literally eating up the planet. So does that scare you? I mean, are you, are you a hopeful person? Let me put it this way. Unless one has the courage to be hopeless, then one does not have the courage to be hopeful. I'm, I'm by temperament a hopeful person, but I have no hope. I think the catastrophe that we're saying is looming has already happened. So I think we're living in a state of shock, and it's called ordinary daily living. And by that I mean we're on speed and rush hour outrunning our future. And it seems all so normal. And, that, and this is what these films are about. How to see that which is hidden in plain sight. 
how to see that the world we live in, especially in Wonderland, in the, you know, all of the facility that we have in the Northern Hemisphere, or in Europe, or in Japan, um, how that is, um, you know, literally eating up the planet and has, to me, has already eaten up the planet. So when I say we're in a state of shock, I mean that what we call ordinary is, for me, the shock that, that we live in. We live like zombies. I mean, we're only fragile human beings, so we can only, you know, we live within our own self-interest. But that doesn't change, for me, the fact that we've now transited from local community individuals into a term I would like to call mass man, where, where we all have the same news, we buy the same things, we wear the same clothes, we see the same movies, we are homogenizing the world. The beauty of the world is that it's not homogenized. How boring it would be to have one weather pattern, one bird, one language, one automobile, one government, etc. The beauty of the world is its diversification. Through that web of diversity is held the unity of the world. We've inverted it through the web of homogenization. We are holding the world together. It's called the globalized world in which we live. And we, you and I, are living in the very epicenter of it. As Martin Amos says, America is test driving the future. And uh, these are things, I mean, forget about the newspapers or the political events or the drama with the Republicans and all that kind of stuff. These are the events that are so present, they're hidden in plain sight, they're unobservable by virtue of their presence. And this is what these films try to do, try to help us see that which is present, but like all art, by changing the perspective. So, in the case of Koyanis Katsi, if you want to see traffic, if I showed you traffic, um, you know, in a normal, ordinary way, it would look like traffic. But if I use the tools of the medium, which is technology is the medium of art, okay? If I use those tools, then I can, by in an inverse relationship, by shooting very slow, I can speed up that image. I can create a visage or, a, or an entity out of the, um, uh, as it were, the, uh, the traffic. All of these films are based on, two, on, a, on the idea. If, if those of you that are filmmakers, you know the following. There's a foreground and a background going on. The foreground is where the characterization, plot, story takes place. The background is the DP doesn't even shoot it, second unit guys are shooting it. It's the drive in the car, it's the building you're passing by, the moon at night, whatever it happens to be. That's what I'm interested in. So what I take, what I did was take the background and made it the foreground and eliminated the traditional foreground. So I made the building, what I said earlier, like Marilyn Monroe. And we would want to shoot it with the same lighting, makeup, uh, attention to detail because it's in a doc, usually the images are used to illustrate a talking voice. That seems, while that's interesting, it was not interesting to me. So, because I didn't go to school, I couldn't make the mistake of making a regular kind of film. And I'm not pleased, I'm not being heavy on school. I taught grade school, high school, and lectures in college, but um, I'm for de-schooling society rather than schooling society. I think the more we know, the more informed we are, the less we know. That might sound ridiculous. Uh, there was a study done a number of years ago um, among people in, in, I think, the Northeast, maybe Boston, Cambridge. Those that were most educated had the least insight as to what was happening. Who are the people that know most about global warming? Those people that have never been educated in their life. In this country, it's the Hispanic people that know most about it because they're the people on the front line. They're living it. They're living it in their own home and they're being sent here. So education is a two-edged you know, two sword. Um, uh, 
knowing very little, we're subject to believe in anything, and that's the problem. The less, and what we know is very small, we all know that. I mean, we live in a very big universe, okay? And the, our language is limited completely, and so we have to have the humility to know that what we know is very small. And if not, then we become believers in anything. My own point of view is scratch the surface, and there's an ism within every one of us. And in this case, that ism is not communism. Or, I, mean, I think we're terroristic, but that's another story. But it's consumerism. We are consuming the planet. How early did you know you were going to do a trilogy? Um, I was talking to Philip in 1978, and I was very excited about the film, and um, I was really, and I was telling the Phil, gee, I'm so turned on about this, maybe we could think about another one even, and he said, that's, that's a great idea, he says, you know, things always go better in three. Now, I don't want to show you my tattoos, and I won't show you all of them, but I'll show you one. I'm obsessed with three. Three is, I can't, I don't want to try to tell you why, but I even have it on my finger. Three lines, an asterisk. It's a star for me. So when we both kind of came to it at one point, and uh, that was before the film was finished. Huh. Wow. Um, have you been approached over the years t by people to please make this, please make this, we want you to come and make this? Do you get I a lot of requests, and do you ever say yes? I never say yes. Mm -hmm. I was approached, it will be a little self-serving, so excuse me, by Disney to redo, uh, uh, what is the famous film with Imogen? Uh, Fantasia? Fantasia. Oh. But I know enough about working with people at Disney, because I knew some people there. I mean, it's a fool's path, OK? They're never going to let you do what you want. I asked them, oh yeah, whatever you want, we'll do. Well, I know that's not true. And I didn't want to get into that kind of event. I am asked by other people to maybe make their film for them. Uh, I have an idea, would you want to make this film with me, which means for me. But I'm not interested. I, I, I don't, you know, we all have a short time span here and I have other projects I want to do. and. Uh, so I'd, I'd rather stay on my own path and let everyone stay on their own path. Do you want to tell people how visitors came to be while I queue it up and show a little bit of it? And sure. So after the trilogy was done. After the trilogy was done, the trilogy began in 1975 and was completed in 2003. Um, after that was done, um, I got this idea that I would like to do a film on the border, and I uh, wanted to use um, um, Senkaijuku, or the, um, uh, what is it called, um, somebody help me, uh, what, what is the theater that Senkaijuku is part of, the, come on, you guys are academics, tell me, what is it, I can't remember, I'm embarrassed, it's a form, it comes from the old no theater in, in Japan. Not kabuki, no, no. Come on, it's it's a, it's an underground performance art, where it's all in body language. They paint themselves frequently. They're naked. What is it called? I'm embarrassed. I can't. Anyway, it's unimportant. So I wanted to use those actors, okay, and they're terrific, and um, but I couldn't get any traction, and. My films usually take anywhere from seven to nine years before I'm able to find an angel willing to do something maybe that they regret later on. And um, so I went through a reiteration and then I went through a script called uh, Savage Eden and uh, got quite excited about that. But having a couple of years to work on it, I put it aside and went to a film that I thought could be, that I could achieve because it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. I wanted to make a film that was, as it were, in the crucible of stillness. And that's when I stumbled on what I called originally the Holy Sea. 
And I wanted that as the title of the film, but for all kind of reasons it ended up visitors, which I'm happy to. But um, that's kind of the origin of it. I worked on it from 2003 to 2009, and I got traction then, and I had some angels step up, um, two ladies from Montreal, um, and my traditional angel, Dan Noyes and uh, they were able to put the money together. I told them that, and I didn't have to, but that this film won't make a penny, that if you're looking for money, you better go to a bank because you get more money on the interest of the money you would give me than what I'm gonna make for you. And they said, oh, Godfrey, that's okay. We're not interested in a return. And uh, so it was a write-off for them. And uh, they were willing to, um, to put in 4.8 million dollars to make this film. Uh, the film took almost three years to do. Every shot in it is a special effect, though it was all special effected to make it look like real clear photography. So, uh, in other words, the effects were not buildings flying apart and people flying through the air and all that kind of stuff. It was to perfect the image. So in perfecting it, we would give it its most elegant voice. Um, you'll notice in this film that um, a big part of the film is the black in the film. Now, if you look at that screen behind me, that's a two-dimensional flat surface. As you know from cinema, the blacker the blacks, the more the illusion of depth in the film. And so, um, what you're going to see in this film is, an e is not only the black of a, um, of a digital camera, the red camera. I had opportunity through Soderbergh to use prototype cameras. I was lucky. And, uh, and we then made it even blacker in post so that we would, in because we, want, we, we were going out in 4K for this film. It's one of the first films done in 4K. Now their project is to show it, but if you show that film in 4K, unlike Blu-ray or a regular DVD, it is so sharp, it has, and the blacks are so black that it has almost a three-dimensional quality to it. Let me run a little of the first movement. Okay.
So watching that is like trying to stop smoking cigarettes. It's a deprogramming experience. <laughs> I apologize, but that was the intention. The, the whole film, it's 87 minutes, 33 seconds, with 74 images. An average of about 70 seconds an image. By Eastern, Europe, Eastern European standards or some Russian standards, this is a very quick film. <laughs> but uh, truly, truly. Um, but uh, those films, you know, they pay, if you go to Paris, there are more cinemas than any place in the world. There are always a theater where you'll see these kind, not this kind, but films that are much slower than this film. But those are for the cognoscenti. They're, as you notice, they don't have people around the block coming to see that or this kind of film. Um, so this, this film is a, you know, it makes a demand on someone. It, it's not clearly entertainment. In fact, it's been called the most expensive screensaver ever made. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, but I knew that in making it. The, the premise of the film is that the stiller a person is, the more heightened their senses become. And it's premised on the reciprocal gaze. Not only are you looking at the image, the image is looking at you. There's a shot of a gorilla in the uh, film, and the gorilla is a female, western female lowland gorilla. If we had shot her in Uganda, or as we did in the Bronx Zoo, where they spent $34 million to make it look like Uganda, uh, then you would be seeing a gorilla. But while shooting it in the Bronx Zoo, we had to shoot, you know, it took a month to get that shot, of, which we used three of it. The, the beautiful gorilla, Trishka, uh, looked into the camera for almost 20 minutes, which astounded us all. Now, whether we knew that she was looking, and whether she knew that she was looking in the camera, she was looking at us for whatever reason. We had a very long 400 millimeter lens on it, so we could be right up on it, because she was like 50, 60 feet away from us. And, uh, but if we had shown you that shot where it was made in the zoo, then you'd be looking at a gorilla. But when you take the background out by rotoscoping each hair of that gorilla, because that's what it takes it, to make it look real, then no longer are you looking at a gorilla, she's looking at you. She's the adult in the room. And uh, uh, so it, it's those kind of effects that we were looking for. What's the casting process like, finding all of those faces, including children? How did that come about? Well, um, first of all, I, all of these, none of those people are actors, so I only wanted them to be what I call we actors, because I wanted an authentic response. I didn't want, now would you please be emotionally sorrowful or be glad. That, that's phony baloney, unless you're a really great actor. And these are all people, I don't believe in the best of anything. It's not the best movie, the best school, the best this, the best girl, boy, whatever. We're all the best if we believe in it. We can all walk on water. So I felt that I wanted to randomly. So the first shots, let's say the second man you saw here, he's an undocumented worker from Guatemala who uh, was on a street corner in New Orleans with about 25 other guys looking for work. So I employed all of them for the day, and because I had a little money, and uh, the a girl was, uh, you know, a friend of a friend, and I had during the course of two days over 143 people shot like this. I went into an old folks' home. They gave me permission. You'll see a beautiful old black lady here. It, it just almost take, makes me in tears when I see her. She's so strong. And so everybody was just randomly picked, and then we shot enough so that we could choose the stuff we wanted to do. And as the film progresses, there are people who are watching TV and people who are gaming, and then a group of individuals, and then a group of people who are at the final four basketball game. All of those shots were done in a studio that I rented in Brooklyn for the uh, kids. Uh, they were simply what I didn't want them to do anything that they hadn't already done. They all watched TV, so I'm not asking them to do something they haven't done. But, oh, the batteries went out. 
Maybe somebody has to help me. I'm sorry. Here comes someone. Okay. Yes, thank you. And um, so, in other words, they all do that. They knew they were being filmed. They were with lights and all of that stuff. And no, you can leave that there. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And, um, but the second the TV comes on, it's like a tractor beam. We go right out of ourselves. I spent a lot of time watching kids and older people, those two categories especially. Older people drool constantly when they watch TV. If you're an older person, check your mouth sometime. If, uh, or, or the gaping mouth, I call the gaping mouth, in front of the TV. If you could see yourself, you'd be horrified, okay? Kids get, they have like automaticities. You know what that is? It's an emotional state that flies through your face like that. It's like, it's, it's, it's something that automatically comes through your face. So all of those, when that TV goes on, it's like a tractor beam, as I said. Now, if I wanted, since I wanted to have direct eye contact with the audience, then we use the equivalent of a teleprompter. You know what a teleprompter is? Teleprompter is where the TV is down here, but it's being, shown through a two-way mirror up here. So what they're seeing is, a, is the image through a two-way mirror, even though the TV's down here, okay? And, um, um, and we're shooting directly through that mirror into their face. Now you would say, well, gee, they knew they were being filmed, but let me say, or the guys playing games. There was a guy playing a game, he was so excited that when I showed, it's in the film, everybody thought the dude was masturbating. Um, I know that sounds terrible, but, you know, everybody knows what that's about, but he was all excited, he was all, <laughs> and he was just, you know, he was trying to move his thing, and then he got great satisfaction, it was like he had it, you know, he finished his ejaculation, and he was so happy, he beat the other guy, as well. So, those are all authentic responses to real events, and that's what I wanted to achieve. And you chose black and white, which was a d departure for you. Yes. Um, this is arguable, but my own feeling is that black and white is a much more emotive uh, uh, photographic medium than color. Color contemporizes the image. It, uh, it makes it part of the natural world because we, we, we are people of color. When you put something in black and white, you then get to deal more with the essence of the subject rather than being distracted. When color is present, your eye, precognitive, goes to the color and has to reorganize the whole thing so that you make sense out of it, okay? And black and white makes it, you don't have that distraction. Even like if you're wearing a shirt and it has different colors on it, that's, your eye is noticing that even though you're not conscious of it. So black and white was a deliberate choice, and especially in this film because I wanted, the dimensionality of the flat medium was most important, and uh, black gave me that. Mm. Now, um, we promised Q&A from the audience, and I was instructed to repeat the question. So, um, it's your turn, folks. So anybody who's got a question, speak it. I'll, I'll repeat it and so that everybody can hear it, and uh, we'll see what Godfrey says. Yeah, if, if you're looking for a, a dimension, did it ever occur, did you ever have the opportunity or, or, or not to use stereo to shoot in 3D? To, oh, you're asking if, to, to use shoot 3D? 3D? Yeah. Ah. Well, I've never done it, but I'm on the verge of doing it right now. I have another film, possibly, that will be IMAX 3D. And the color will be hand-painted on black and white, degraded as if you were seeing it from 1896, even though it's of the contemporary world. That will be one look. The other look is that brand new Technicolor look from 1939, think Wizard of Oz, of deep saturation. So I'm using color in a completely different way because of the subject matter. It's the subject matter that to me will tell me whether I want to use color or black and white. 
in this case 3D, I have for the first time actors in my film for this one coming up, and there is a narrative form. However, it's a non-spoken narrative. It's the narrative of a buffoon, of a mime, of someone who through facial expression, eye behavior, gesture, is uh, making his, he's the storyteller for this fairy tale. And uh, in 3D, you know, the effect of 3D is to make you duck because the, you know, the spaceship is coming at you or when the 3D first came out in the early 50s, it was a tomahawk being thrown at you and everybody ducking. I mean, that's all fine, but I want something much more subtle. So my actors are not face to face with each other, which makes you then a voyeur looking at this event on the stage. My actors are in direct dialogue with the audience through anarchic comedic behavior of the, of the buffoon. The buffoon, if, here's what the buffoon does. If you say, now, this will be my right hand. Would you please point to the right? In other words, the buffoon does every, it's an anarchic event. That's not a good example, but it, for me it was. But anyway, <laughs> what I'm trying to get to is that uh, my, my storyteller will be able to reach out and high five the kids in the audience. It's a fairy tale for children and the child within us all. Um, he'll be able to hold this crystal ball and you'll be able to touch it or try to. So the guy who I'm working with said, well, how am I going to do that? I can't look over here and there at the same time. He said, what, you know the answer. Just look directly into the lens and everybody in the theater will think you're looking at them. So he'll be able to reach out, touch the kids, high-five them, and through humor we'll deal with this very dense subject of, uh, of uh, climate change. Yes? Um, you said before that working with games was one of the most important experiences to you. Yep. Um, could you uh, speak about what you took away from that experience with the biggest, some of the biggest. I worked for 11 years with street gangs in northern New Mexico. That's where I saw that film by Bunuel, as I told you. Um, it was, without question, the most intense period of my life. And believe me, making films is very intense. But that was like uh, the Girl Scouts compared to uh, the Navy SEALs, which was working with these kids. And it was the most rewarding experience of my life. I didn't do so as a social worker. Uh, not that I don't believe in that, but that's not what I wanted to do. I did it as an organizer. And there were seven gangs in the community I lived in, all territorially based and all fighting each other. If you go into the neighborhood, you could get whacked. You know how that works. You had to be careful. So here I am. At that point, I weighed 250 pounds. As tall as I am now, I had a big black robe on and a collot, and I would got permission to walk through the streets. And I wasn't particularly afraid, and I had the garb of Catholicism all over me. It was a Catholic community, and they were amazed. They'd never seen. The only time you see a priest or a brother was in church or in a very expensive car somewhere, probably. So walking through the barrio, I got to feel what it was like and I identified immediately uh, in each of the gangs over a period, when I say immediately after meeting them, but that took a while, where they trusted me, who the leaders of the gangs were. And I developed, I hate to get academic on you now, but a concept called society subculture personality. I know that sounds a little academic, but at that time that's where my head was. And, I use that as a way, if I could get the leaders of the gangs to come together, then I would find that the gangs themselves would be willing to come together because the main men and women of the gang were willing to come and have a council with me. So we created a big clubhouse. Uh, we got in a lot of trouble from the police. Uh, I've, if you've been in high school and played athletics, you wear your colors on your football jacket. Well, all the kids I worked with never went to, or they were thrown out of school, basically. Most of them, all of them. 
and uh, there were a lot of them, several hundred, and uh, we all had our jackets, our red jackets, which flipped out the community because these are gang members and they're toughies. But they were taking care of themselves. You know, if you tell a kid he's a shit or she's a shit, then they'll probably be one. If you tell them they're great, most will arise to the occasion. So we were, you know, helping poor people rebuild their house, taking care of little kids who were on glue, glue snippers. In other words, a self-help project where there could be dignity rather than service offered to these people, where they could do it for themselves. And that was by far the most intense experience of my life. And it stayed with me like a tattoo, like a watermark, till this point. And so the, uh, was there something about people that you learned from that that you didn't know the money to? Yes. Um, <coughs> I, I had the opportunity to experience the beauty of raw emotion unchecked. Un, uh, that means from rage to love. What I found with these people is that they were not polite. I don't like polite people, okay? Because it's just polite. It's a surface thing. It's something you learn and you can't help yourself. I don't mean I don't like that, but these people told you what they felt. I felt them, they felt me. I was everything from a mother to a father to an uncle, an aunt, a brother, a sister. I was loved and hated all at the same time like happens in the family. So I was privileged to be able to experience that emotional atmosphere that was their real world and not be treated as, uh, as an outsider and someone that uh, you know they would be nice to. And that has stayed with me. It's, in, it's affected me. Uh, yeah, and I'm gonna repeat what you say because I guess it's for the television recording, right? Even though everyone can hear. You're not Mike, so I'm, it's re redundant, but go ahead, Chris. Very good. One of my favorite shots of going out of Scotty is where a group of people are lounging on the beach. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, the camera tilts up, and there's a nuclear reactor moving in the background. Yeah. Where was that? Oh, San Onofre. This was the shot in Koyana Scotty with the people on the beach. The camera goes up, nuclear reactor in the background. Little Volkswagen comes by. Yes. Yes, that was, it was too good not to shoot. Yeah. And it was a random thing. We were coming from another shoot, and we realized that here's this big dome nuclear event, and all these people on the beach. So it was, a, you know, like shooting fish in a tank. <laughs> yes, please. Could you compare and contrast using analog digital production tools to digital production tools? Oh, yes. I analog would. to digital. Mm. Um, my own preference up till 2010 was absolutely analog. I had seen starting in the 90s all of the tests on digital. They would bring you to like Technicolor or some lab and they would put up an analog and then throw up a digital. It was in its nascent form. I never bought it, okay? And um, then through Steven Soderbergh, who's a big fan of digital, uh, red camera in particular, um, in fact, helped develop it. Um, he said, well, you ought to really check this out, Godfrey, because um, you might be really surprised. That was for visitors. And um, so I did, and I was more than surprised. I was very happy. And it became important because, let's say, the gorilla I was talking about, to shoot the gorilla not in a dock way, but where she's directly eye contact with you, you have to wait for that moment. You can't demand it. Okay? And had I done that, and that means the camera has to be running almost continuously. If I had done that in celluloid, I would have never been able to grab that shot. Also, the crews I work with, except for John Kane, who's now in his early 50s, so he has the other experience, most of the people I work with are in their 20s and 30s, and analog is like a thousand years ago for them. Uh, if you try to edit in analog, unless you're Steven Spielberg, you can't afford to do it. Nobody can fix the equipment anymore, there are no more technicians, nobody knows how to use it, and he doesn't even use a flatbed, he uses an upright. Um, 
but he has the money to pull that off, so he can repair them, he has the kind of editors that can do it. But everything is edited in digital, that's a given now. And also, before it happened visually, it happened at least maybe 15 years before in, in uh, music. It became the norm in music, um, which really freaked me out because of the compression. I don't, I much prefer an analog recording, but it, now it's almost impossible to pull that off unless you have, again, a lot of money. So I'm happy to work in the medium. Um, the main thing is that it gets seen. What made me go to digital is that I could do it in 4K, which is like really super resolution. And the film I'm going to embark on now is in 12K, which is like on steroids, okay. So I'm, and had, if the new film that I'm work, going to work on, if I use analog, the cameras weigh between 240 and 260 pounds. When you turn them on, they sound like a Volkswagen, and the spherical lenses are not that great for it. Um, so I'm using now a new, I would use, an, if I get to do this, I should say, I'm already assuming I'm going to do it, but I don't want to be assumptive. If I get to do it, I'm using a 34-pound camera developed by Aeroflex and IMAX together that have, that shoots two images at the same time. And it's only 34 pounds, so it gives me an enormous reach in terms of where I can put that. I can also use it as a, um, as a animation stand. To put the other one up, I mean, would take uh, engineering of a major kind to do 3D and uh, IMAX animation stand. So I'm, I'm up for it, you know, it's the medium. Now I've given that up and I'm happy to be in that medium. Yes, please. You mentioned earlier that one of uh, the first experience, the first strong experience with cinema was, and you used the word, the revelation uh, when seeing uh, Los Olvidados by, by the world. And of course, we were a brother at the time, so it's obvious that for you, cinema and spirituality dialogue with each other, and when we watch your films, it is also obvious that there is a connection between the spiritual experience and the experience of cinema. Could you talk about this? How uh, it is for you to make films, or to watch films, or to live cinema, how uh, all of that is close to a, a spiritual experience? The question is, cinema as a spiritual experience? Well, I do believe that. I mean, I can't lay that on anyone else, but, um, you know, we are creatures of senses, and our, I, I don't believe there's a, I don't believe we have a spirit and then we have a body. The, when the name, the flesh, if you look at it, it's biblical, or it's, it's uh, the etymology of the word, the word flesh comes from the world itself. It doesn't mean just this. It means the very world, the very, the very physicality of the place itself. Knowing that we're sensate beings, we do become what we see, hear, touch, smell, taste. This is who we are. This is the fragility of who we are, the humility. We become the place we live in. And for me to, uh, so, feeling that our spirit is implicated in our flesh, which is my feel, I can't lay that on you, but I don't feel there's a dichotomy between that. I think maybe we make a dichotomy in order to differentiate or to talk about, but to me, it's one medium, it's hand in glove, it's, it's the same medium. So, poetry to me is, is quintessentially a spiritual event. Um, the, as you know better than I, the, the role of the poet, uh, her role is to, like a, like a good stew, to simmer, to simmer down until just the, as little as possible is left with the most nourishment possible. Because it's only by simmering it down that you get all of the taste into the fewest things that are present. So I see cinema in the same way. And to me, this is a complete spiritual experience. Um, I can't, I don't think cinema is used 
in that way, to be, that's my limited point of view. There are other practitioners, I could name them, that do. Tarkovsky, Pelajan, uh, et cetera, et alia, but um, the, the generally cinema is hijacked by entertainment and information. Those are the two mediums of cinema. And they're, they're, the only limit of cinema is our imagination. If I could be so provocative right now, any of you film students? Anybody here? Few, okay. Well, my comments are just to the few of you. I want to discourage you as much as possible because I want to let you know that most films that are thought about are never completely finished being thought about. Most films that begin being written are never finished being written. Most films that go into production never finish the production. Most films that finish the production are never seen. So unless you're committed like to an insane asylum, which I am, then don't be a filmmaker because it will take that. It has to be something, it, 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 be, it becomes your destiny if you want to be a filmmaker because the odds against anything happening are terrific. So you have to be committed, as I said, like to an asylum to pull it off. So good luck. Um, you used the Polish proverb and, and said that you begin the work and the work tells you how to proceed. So what do you say to your angels when you're trying to raise the money? Ah, well, what, what do you say to your angels when you're trying to raise the money? First of all, I act as if I know what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> That's important, okay? Because it's not what you say, it's how you say it, okay? The second thing is, of course, I make preparation. I get all nervous and everything. Uh, when you're sitting in front of a potential donor, it's like a ride up on the elevator. You have to, it's called the elevator speech. You have to make it in that short a time. You have to have it together in your head. So by the time I'm finished raving, I, I, I probably look like I should be institutionalized, but if they feel that I know what I'm talking about, then they say, well, I don't understand him, but I think he knows what he's doing. So I'm saying act as if you know what you're doing. And that's the best I can tell you. Because if I knew what the film was going to be before I made it, I wouldn't be interested in making it. And I try to explain that. And the people, I have a, a constant uh, benefactor, so I'm lucky. I'm like someone who has an angel for my career. And I didn't expect that. But uh, he knows that. I don't have to tell him that anymore. And uh, he's willing to give me money as a burnt offering, which is amazing. Other questions? Um, could you name a few books, a few books that you think are important to you and that you would recommend, and books that you might not know? Recommended books? Alternating Current, Octavio Paz. Blow your mind. If you read, I'm, I love that. I'm not going to recommend Wittgenstein on uh, philosophy, but those of you that love aphorisms, which I do, try that sometime. If you're looking for coherency and uh, clarity, don't read that book. Joseph Brodsky's A Room and a Half. Love it. Um, let's see. Uh, Jacques Ellul, any number of his films, but particularly The Technological Society. Uh, one of the great, great books of all times, in my opinion. Ivan Illich, uh, Tools for Conviviality, um, a masterpiece in my opinion. Um, Nikolai Burdayev, I'm trying to remember the name of his book. Uh, oh, The Beginning and the End. Unbelievable book. Um, let's see, what else? There's a lot, but that's a good start. Okay. Gregory Corso's poems. You know Gregory Corso? Genius poet. What about favorite films? Favorite films. Los Olvidados. 
And then uh, my favorite film is actually a film probably none of you have seen uh, by an Armenian filmmaker. We're ex almost exactly the same age. I'm very happy to say we're close friends. Uh, his name is Artavas Pelajan, The Four Seasons. Um, just look up his, his um, uh, what do you call it, films. I was saying at lunch, if fire is the metaphor, I make sparks, he makes lightning bolts. So you should see this guy, it's amazing. His work is amazing. To me, he's like the archangel of filmmaking. And now he's retired, and he's never made a feature. His longest film, I think, our, uh, is Our Century, and I think that's just over 50 minutes. Not that he didn't want to make a feature, but uh, he lived in the old Soviet Union, now Russia, Moscow most of the time, and not because of ideological reasons, which do keep some people away from cinema there, but for jealousy, because he's so brilliant, he was never allowed to do anything other than a short film, which they knew would only play at festivals and not get into the real world. So it's a real tragedy. Those are my favorite films. Yes? What's your advice on freelance filmmaking? On freelance? Freelance filmmaking advice. What does that mean? Just For like being out in the field. What, what can you, um, it's, how can you inspire me for freelance filmmaking? Get as high as possible, okay? <laughs> in terms, all I mean by that is, you know, open your senses up to the place you're in because every place has a genie in the bottle, as it were. You can find it, you can hear the voice of it. Uh, the most difficult part of filmmaking and yet the most rewarding is the, is the shooting, the principal photography, uh, because it's so demanding. Um, I would suggest if you want to do that, to always get up with the sunrise and shoot then because it's more conducive, it's the golden hour, as well as sunset. Those two hours are fantastic. Now, if you're shooting in infrared, you can shoot at any time of the day because that's a completely eliminated. But, um, and I would recommend the following. Um, since I think film is a collaborative medium at the end of the day, um, do this with other people. Have a group that, uh, like a, uh, where, where your souls are together on what you're trying to do. That's what I'd recommend. Also, the less you need and the less you want, the more opportunity you'll have to do what you want, okay? Now, if you need an education, if you need a car, if you need insurance, if you need uh, vacations, if you need fashion, if you need drugs, whatever it happens to be. Let's leave drugs out of it for a while. But if, if you need those other things, then it'll eliminate your freedom. They tie you down. The more you have, the more tied you are to gravity. Film is like floating. You want to float. You want to be light. You don't want to have that burden of having to make a payment every month on something that means nothing anymore. So I would say live mean and lean and be willing to uh, sacrifice an enormous amount for what you want. Yes? Uh, you said that you conceptualized the trilogy around the time of the first film, and I'm, one, uh, the trilogy. And I'm wondering if uh, there were any techniques or anything that you used to sustain your presence of mind over such a long period so that you didn't tire of the work or decide to change the message? How did you not tire of the work over the years to, it took to make the trilogy? It's a good question. Maybe, maybe uh, obsession. Um, the, the, to do the, what I have to do is uh, be willing to realize that I'm not going to get the money right away. And it's a good thing, actually, in retrospect. If I got the money after each film, I wouldn't have the time to really sit with the film and let it sit with me and let it change me. I would have a very I would have a very limited view of complexity is what I'm saying. I want to deal more with the complexity that I can't possibly imagine right now, but through time will reveal itself to me. So what was your question? 
I guess, um, how do you, for such a long piece of Oh yeah, so keeping that, that distance, I realize that I have to stay focused or it's not gonna happen. So I feel highly privileged actually. I have a studio in Santa Fe, an old automobile garage. Doesn't have any insulation, unfortunately, but it has a lot of good vibes, a 16-foot ceiling, 2,000 square feet. It's a day room for the old guys that have nothing to do anymore, that come over and talk politics and drink beer in the other side of the studio, not in my side. And um, I'm fortunate to be able to sit there and stew in this every day, so it actually turns me on. I know that sounds a little frightening, but uh, I get, that's what turns me on, the opportunity to do that. Then I spend an enormous amount of time trying to get the money. And I have to, you know, I have to believe, you have to will the film into existence. If you give it up, then it gives you up. But if you keep putting that out, that this is going to happen, you create your own reality. And that's what I'm doing, or trying to do. And that's something that anyone can do. As I said, I don't believe in the best. I believe that all of us, very fragile individuals, can make miracles if only we believe that we can do so. And that takes, you know, you have to walk the walk. And suffering is part of that. Sacrifice is part of it. But that sacrifice can be joyous. Now maybe I'm revealing my, my background as a, as a monk, but um, uh, I think it's true for everything. If one is not willing to sacrifice something that's unimportant, for example, fashion or success or all those other things that are ephemeral, uh, for what you really want, then you won't get that. So you have to stay focused on what it is. And then it keeps revealing, gets richer and richer and richer. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I was wondering if the campaign you did in 1974 for the New Mexico Civil Liberties Union, um, you, you know, it, it, you tried to have it go big and it, it couldn't go as big in the end because of what happened in Chicago, I guess. Um, well, in New York at the headquarters, the director of the ACLU got fired for other reasons. Okay. Okay. Well, basically I was wondering why um, you didn't do, consider doing another, it sounded like it had a fairly significant impact. And what ultimately motivates the change from doing this kind of mass media campaign to doing films? Well, it's, it's one, the, the as, as each year accumulates, the media became more and more and more expensive, for one thing, meeting to do adverts. And I really wasn't interested in doing adverts, but I realized that people like a tractor beam are, are, are in an inescapable position because we live in a world where mediation is everywhere. I was saying, I think last night or sometime, that if you, today, just this day, you've probably seen more images without consciously being aware of it than a person lived in the Middle Ages saw in their entire life. So we're inundated with it. But to answer your question more, um, I didn't want to wait around for something else, and I had a crew, people that were chomping at the bit to do something, and I had an angel that funded the privacy campaign and he wasn't going to put up the ACLU as an organization, would have had to put up the money for a national campaign. Costs a lot of money, more than a film. So we decided to go immediately into a film. I would, I would have liked to follow through on it because I think that's a window that's inescapable. I, one of my great ambitions in life is to do a Super Bowl ad. <laughs> I mean, that's really? really one of them. Yes, indeed. Because there's so many people gazing at that. And so taking the idea of doing the odd one not out but in, what an opportunity. I have to get someone to, you know, give me the money to produce it and pay a million dollars for 30 seconds. But it would be, the impact could be terrific. So if the, any of you wealthy people in the audience want to talk to me later, we could collaborate on 
the next Super Bowl ad. Do a GoFundMe. What's that? Do a GoFundMe. Okay. Go no, no, it's not about funding. This would be about provocation. This would be doing something in diametric opposition to the madness of what uh, adverts are about. This would be giving them something, not like visitors, okay, that would be too heavy, but something else. Like I wanted to use, I had this idea for the Bronx Zoo, having been there for so long in preparation for the shoot, sitting with gorillas and a month shooting the gorillas at three different periods. And I said, to, after the photography came out, I loved it and I offered it to them because they were not for profit. And I've researched this, Times Square is, you know, the mo and some places in, in Japan as well, are the most illuminated s centers of any city on the planet, okay? That's true in Japan as well. They have some tremendous locations. Those are where millions of people come every day. I wanted to put on one of those billboards on the, at 42nd and Broadway, it used to be the Allied Chemical Building there, I forget what it's called now, but it's where they have one, two, three, four, probably six big screens, and there's one that's gigantic. So I wanted to put that gorilla's face up there, mm. and having that gorilla check out, with advertising nothing, okay? And it would have been great for the Bronx Zoo. Just the little tag, Bronx Zoo, at the end. And just put it on a repeat, but they weren't, they looked at me like something was wrong with me. <laughs> Maybe it was. It show, it, you know, any of you are misfits like I am, that's a great value to be a misfit. Because then you, you can see things that those that fit in never see. So let me advocate that. Anything else while we still have Godfrey? Because it's sure been an inspirational evening. Thank you. It's I had a good time. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> and we look forward to your next film and your Super Bowl ad. Hey, yes. Please see me if you have the money.